This video will cover the supplement quercetin as part of the EDS, MCAS, and POTS supplement reviews. Keep in mind that this video does not constitute medical advice. If in doubt, it is always important to speak to a trusted medical professional regarding the next steps in your health care plan. These recommendations use an amalgamation of research, personal experience, and community suggestions. Quercetin is a plant pigment known as a flavonoid that comes in a citron yellow crystal. It is insoluble in cold water and poorly soluble in hot water but is fat and alcohol soluble. It occurs in various fruits and vegetables with capers being the highest at 234 mg per 100 grams. It can also be found in berries, apples, onion, brassica vegetables, grapes, shallots, tea, tomatoes, nuts, seeds, and green tea which is lowest at 2 mg per 100 grams. Please click on the link below to find a list of the quercetin content in common foods. The quercetin content presumably is higher in organic fruit and veg, with one study suggesting an increase in 79% compared to conventional. Different parts of the plant may have a higher concentration as well, with the middle of onions having more than the outer rings. Quercetin is also found in medicinal botanicals, including ginkgo bilabar, St. John's wort, and black elderberry. Dietary intake of quercetin differs in countries as it depends on fruit, veg, and tea consumption. For example, in China the consumption is approximately 18 mg per day, twice as much as the United States. Men often have a lower intake of fruit and veg, and therefore have lower quercetin intake on average. Surprisingly, the intake of quercetin was estimated to be similar in both winter and summer months, with onions and green tea supplying the highest amount in the United States. In Australia, tea and apples were the dominant source of quercetin intake with an average of 340 mg per day. Spain was the next highest in tape with an average of 18.48 mg per day. Overall, quercetin is touted as a dietary flavonoid and supplement that helps reduce inflammation, acting as an antioxidant, reducing swelling, and increasing disease and viral resistance. It has also been suggested to aid in blood sugar control. It is known to be anticarcinogenic and a psychostimulant. It helps with energy via mitochondrial biogenesis and inhibits lipid peroxidation, platelet aggregation, and capillary permeability all of which reduce risk of stroke and heart attack. Lipid peroxidation increases free radicals in the body and damages cells. What does the research say about these claims, however? Animal models in rats have supported immune modulation, anti-inflammatory effects, and touts mobility recovery following spinal cord injury. For example, studies on inflammation have shown that quercetin supplementation can reduce clinical signs of arthritis by reducing the inflammatory effects of high-fat foods and other known inflammatory dietary components. Rats that suffered spinal cord injury and we paralyzed were able to walk again, although with deficit following intraperitoneal doses of quercetin over the period of a few weeks. Another study on spinal cord injured rats that were unable to walk suggested that injecting quercetin twice daily over the span of 3 to 10 days led to half of the animals being able to walk again. Although, when they received injections three times a day, no animals recovered walking ability. These studies on spinal cord injuries suggest there is a Goldilocks zone to recovery in terms of quercetin supplementation. We can better understand quercetin by evaluating its mechanism of action in non-human animal models. Research suggests that it increases cytokine secretion which protects against irradiation-induced inflammation. Quercetin also showed effects against myocardial oxidative injury and immunity function impairment both of which lead to the sustained damages from heart attack. Quercetin could reduce acute inflammation by reducing chemokin levels, white blood cell recruitment, lipid peroxidation and increased antioxidants. 
Important for those of us with MCAS, it has been shown to improve experimental allergic encephalomyelitis, EAE, by blocking signaling of interleukin-12, Th1, and autoimmune myocarditis by interfering with inflammatory cytokines. It reduces oxidative stress and contributes to the prevention of the accumulation and activation of immune cells and resulting chronic inflammation of adipose tissue in Western diet-induced obese mice. Clearly, quercetin may help in autoimmune conditions and allergic responses. In human-based clinical research, quercetin has shown very promising effects in reducing cardiovascular risk even in the absence of dietary changes within both healthy participants and those with high blood cholesterol. Quercetin has been thoroughly studied for an effect on upper respiratory infection and has had very mixed results. For example, one placebo control trial of 1,000 subjects did not show a significant influence on rates of upper respiratory tract infections. Although, a subgroup of those that were physically fit and over the age of 40 showed a significant reduction in respiratory symptoms and sick days when supplementing with 1,000 mg per day. These studies may be affected by conflicting variables however, such as having stressful jobs, children, or more or less exposure to viral or bacterial respiratory illnesses. Since COVID-19, studies have begun to evaluate the effectiveness of quercetin, and research should be published shortly. Many studies on quercetin have been completed on athletes, rather than chronically ill individual. For some reason. However, these study results may be applicable to us as well given that our bodies are under constant stress similar to someone engaging in constant strenuous exercise. Studying quercetin dosing at 100 mg or 1000 mg per day did not alter exercise-induced changes in several measures of immune function following three days of intense exercise in trained athletes, but it significantly reduced respiratory infection during the two-week post-exercise period to a difference of 1 out of 20 compared to the regular 9 out of 20. Another similar study of supplementation of 1,000 mg per day of quercetin alone three weeks before, during, and two weeks after a three-day period of three hours of cycling in the winter resulted in a markedly lower incidence of upper respiratory tract infection in well-trained subjects in the two weeks after the intensified training, but had no effect on exercise-induced immune dysfunction, inflammation, and oxidative stress. This research suggests that quercetin may either take longer to begin working, or that it is unable to directly change the inflammatory and oxidative stress cycle related to intense exercise. Presumably, inflammation following exercise may be necessary for recovery reasons not investigated in the study or may be related to the actual absorption of the quercetin which will be discussed later. Finally, in general the literature supports antipathogenic capacities when quercetin is cultured with target cells and a broad spectrum of pathogens including respiratory viruses such as rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, and coronaviruses. Research has suggested that the co-ingestion of two or more flavonoids increases their bioavailability and immunity outcomes. For example, when ingesting vitamin C with quercetin, it is better absorbed. Placebo research in untrained young men has suggested that just two weeks of 1,000 mg a day supplementation showed that quercetin significantly reduced post-exercise measures for both inflammation and oxidative stress, with a chronic augmentation of granulocyte oxidative burst activity. It also showed a successful reduction in the illness rates following exercise stress as well as a chronic augmentation of their innate immune function. Presumably, this suggests that the non-athlete population may benefit from quercetin supplementation to reduce their instance of exercise-related immune suppression. The overall research on quercetin is still lacking, however, we have seen in general in vitro and non-human animal research shows that quercetin possesses anti-inflammation and immunological improvement. However, studies in human did not totally support these results. The effect, in which quercetin acts as an immune booster in humans, needs to be further verified for future broad application. 
Unfortunately, the current research on humans primarily investigates populations that would not necessarily use quercetin as there is a focus on men, healthy populations, and athletes. Quercetin is often suggested as a first-line complementary treatment for mast cell activation syndrome. The current in vitro research has shown that quercetin stabilizes mast cell membranes and reduces histamine release. In rats, it can suppress anaphylaxis in sensitized rates, stand inhibit asthmatic inflammation. In humans, it has been shown to be a preventative taken before allergen exposure, with similar strength to chromalin which is an expensive prescription medication used for MCAS. Both chromalin and quercetin are mast cell and basophil stabilizers. Quercetin has been suggested to inhibit the production of enzymes responsible for manufacturing the potent leukotrienes which are inflammatory agents in mast cell reactions. Due to these effects, health practitioners recommend its regular use during an entire allergy season, or year-end. Quercetin also has been suggested to influence hormones, although the research is incredibly contradictory. There have been suggestions that it increases estrogen, decreases progesterone, and does not increase breast cancer rates. Presumably, the increase in estrogen and decrease in progesterone would be beneficial to those of us with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and related conditions due to progesterone increasing the laxity of connective tissue. Unfortunately, quercetin has poor oral bioavailability, with only approximately 2% being absorbed when taken as a supplement. Low bioavailability suggests that quercetin has low absorption, extensive metabolism, and rapid elimination. The estimated absorption of quercetin glucoside which is the naturally occurring form ranges from 3% to 17% in healthy individuals receiving 100 mg. This suggests that the absorption of quercetin is affected by its attached sugar and dietary components such as fiber and fat. Quercetin glucuronic acid and its sulfuric acid derivatives were more easily absorbed than quercetin. Consequently, quercetin from fresh onion and shallot is better absorbed than the quercetin from tea. Quercetin is absorbed in the small intestine, meaning that intestinal damage may reduce the availability to one's body. For example, long-term inflammation from issues such as inflammatory bowel disorders, leaky gut, irritable bowel syndrome or dairy ingestion may inhibit the ability of the intestinal wall to absorb quercetin. Similarly, connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome may inhibit or reduce the ability for the small intestine to absorb this key nutrient. Nervous system damage associated with POTS may similarly reduce the ability for the body to absorb quercetin. One can improve the strength of their intestinal wall with supplementation of the amino acid glutamine, which is key to immune function, and the intestinal wall's health via microvilli regrowth and repair. Quercetin is metabolized in the small intestine, kidney, liver, and colon. Although, the concentrations remain highest in the plasma, which is part of our blood. This suggests that unlike chromalin, quercetin can influence mast cells throughout the body and that it can accumulate in the blood and metabolizing organs. Research suggests that mitochondria may be the area where quercetin concentrates within cells and that elimination is slow with a half-life between 11 to 28 hours. It is most often excreted in either urine or by breathing it out through the lungs. There are some important considerations to consider before supplementing with quercetin. As quercetin is excreted through the kidneys, it is important that kidney function is adequate before using this product or accumulation and potential damage may occur. Most practitioners suggest a safe range of 400 to 600 mg to be taken 1 to 3 times daily and is best taken between meals. I personally take 500 mg upon waking each day to stay on the safer side, with additional quercetin taken if I am to be exposed to more severe allergens that day. As discussed earlier, the absorption of quercetin is quite poor as it is not water-soluble. You can increase the absorption by pairing it with vitamin C, bromelain, folate, or additional flavonoids. 
There is also a newer form of quercetin known as quercetin phytosum which improved the absorption of up to 20 times in healthy volunteers. As quercetin is a commonly used supplement, it can be found in most places. I was able to buy the quercetin. Phytosum from my herb, which will be linked below. I personally do not recommend purchasing any supplements from Amazon due to some past controversies where shoppers were purchasing mislabeled products that did not contain the presumed supplement. Finally, the list of citations used in this video will be linked in the description below if you wish to read more. Thank you for watching, and feel free to subscribe to keep updated on new videos.